Uh, hi everyone, this is Vikas Sani, uh, and I just want to welcome everyone who's with us already and those who are about to join um, for this uh, webinar on the Do No Harm Project. Uh, those of you who are interested in this work, um, you're in for a treat. I think uh, Brandon Coombs and Tanner Caverly, who conceived of this uh, several years ago, have really carried the ball, and they have a lot of useful information to share to make a successful program. We think this is a fantastic program that will really uh, go a long way to beginning to change the culture on the wards. Uh, also with us is Stephanie Chen, who presented a project that was one of this year's two winners for the national competition we held and announced at our conference in San Diego. Uh, and she's doing really interesting work, and I think hopefully she'll tell us a little bit about the spinoff from the initial project and where she's going with it. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to everyone, and we're proud to be working with all of you, and let's get started. Okay, uh, so uh, as Vikas mentioned, I'm Tanner Caverly. Um, we started the Do No Harm Project back in uh, 2012 after I attended the Laon Conference. Um, I attended the conference because of my interest in finding ways uh, to address this huge issue of overuse and low-value health care. Uh, and I was inspired by the conference, particularly uh, by the eloquence of Bernard Laun, who spoke about the social responsibilities of clinicians. I was inspired enough to start the Do No Harm Project uh, with Brandon. And uh, the problem that Brandon and I were trying to solve were what we saw as these really basic errors in clinical reasoning uh, that led to suboptimal care and sometimes led to patient harm. Uh, in, particularly, in particular, uh, we were frustrated with local clinical practices uh, that were driven by the uh, mere possibility of benefit, uh, often a benefit that was vanishingly small uh, or highly theoretical, with little attention to the quality of the evidence supporting that benefit. Um, uh, uh, we were frustrated with decisions to perform tests and procedures and prescribe treatments uh, without a clear understanding of the magnitude of the potential benefit from the intervention. Uh, clinical reasoning that often totally ignored the potential for harm uh, from our well-intentioned interventions. And a rigid kind of black and white view of evidence that did not consider the probabilistic and uncertain nature of benefits and harms for the vast majority of medical interventions. Uh, a rigid view that does not allow room for patient preferences. Um, and our initial inclination was to s simply lament uh, the power of anecdotes and stories to completely uh, overwhelm sound logic and evidence-based reasoning. Uh, but Brandon and I also intuitively understood uh, that stories uh, were always going to be more powerful than statistics and probabilistic evidence. And we also realized that we were telling stories all the time to each other, uh, but our stories were just different. Uh, instead of uh, stories about how we just saw a patient who might have been the uh, one in 1,000 to have avoided a prostate cancer death due to early detection with PSA screening, for instance, we told stories about how we just saw an older patient almost die from a bloodstream infection in the intensive care unit as a downstream complication from a PSA screening test. And how recognizing that as a potential harm of PSA screening really made us think differently about how good of a gamble this screening test was for patients and how informed patient preferences might really differ on PSA testing in an honest way. So we started wondering if there was a way to use stories to harness the power of storytelling uh, and uh, 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 to uh, support and reinforce rather than subvert uh, strong clinical reasoning. And that's kind of how the Do No Harm Project started and uh, why we started it, Brandon and I. Uh, what we really wanted was a broad local conversation that wasn't marginalized about these issues around the appropriateness of the care we provide as well as uh, uh, as well-meaning clinicians and opportunities to make better decisions. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Brandon now, who's going to tell you what the Do No Harm Project is, 
and how you might consider starting a local project if it sounds interesting to you. Brandon? Great. <clears throat> thank you, Tanner, and uh, thank you, Vikas, and everybody at the Lowen Institute for making this possible, and of course, all of our listeners who are joining with us today. So, so what are our goals um, uh, today um, in our time together? And I, what I hope uh, that you'll be able to uh, leave today with is a decent understanding of what is the Do No Harm Project. Tanner alluded to why we started the program, uh, why we think it could be meaningful, and how you might start a similar program in your own institution. So in thinking back to all the key steps, the key lessons along the way uh, that we've learned over the past nearly three years now, we've distilled this down into seven basic steps that hopefully will help you start something similar, uh, whether it's this project or one like it in your own institution. And so I'll just walk you through these and we'll reinforce these um, as we go along. So what I'd encourage you to do when you're thinking about a program like this is to, to not be afraid to think big, but be humble about it and be sure that you start small. Second, be sure that you find your niche, the right venue, have the right message, that's very important. Make it stick. Make sure that people are getting excited about this so that it'll have steam to, to be carried forward. Don't underestimate your potential. I think that's very easy to do. Tanner and I were certainly guilty of this then and probably still guilty of it today. Uh, but the impact that you can have, even with a small local program, can really be robust. Next, if you're going to do something and you think it might have some meaning, don't be afraid to measure that impact. It might seem like a difficult step, but I think that it's something certainly worth considering. Next, don't try to be a hero. Don't try to do it alone. Uh, rely on your community. Rely on your friends to help you with this. It'll really make it a whole lot better. And then finally, advertise and celebrate your successes so that other people can replicate what you're doing. What I'd encourage you to do uh, during the, the call today is to keep an eye out for these blue boxes. And in those blue boxes will contain supporting evidence for uh, what our trainees think who participated in the Do No Harm project and were subsequently stu uh, studied in a recent qualitative analysis of the impact of this program here at the University of Colorado. So what I want to do first is start with a story because these stories indeed are quite powerful. And I'll tell you about a guy named Bill. He's a 55-year-old cattle rancher here in Colorado. And Bill has a remote smoking history. It wasn't especially impressive, 10-pack years, quit about a decade ago. He also has mild asthma. And he was brought to medical attention because of an increasingly painful umbilical hernia. He was referred to one of our clinics for a preoperative evaluation. And Bill said, you know, I really feel fine. I'm breathing fine. My asthma is not a problem. I'm not relying on any of my inhalers. I feel good. The only thing that's a problem right now is this umbilical hernia. It's, it's really bothersome. On examination, everything seemed perfectly fine. His hernia was reducible. This wasn't an emergency, but it was something that needed to be corrected. So here's a picture of maybe not Bill's umbilical hernia, but one just like it. And basically, to uh, make a long story short, because of his asthma history, and because of this remote smoking history, a preoperative chest x-ray was recommended and subsequently obtained. So if we have a look at this chest x-ray, you'll see that something showed up and I'm trying to recall what it was. I think it was, yes, a lung nodule showed up on his chest x-ray. And this was concerning. It was sufficiently concerning that his surgery was canceled. And what ended up happening was a series of tests that had some important consequences. So Bill had a CT of his chest. And thankfully, the CT scan of his chest showed that there really wasn't anything with for malignancy lesion on his adrenal gland, on his left adrenal gland. And so it was recommended that Bill have a dedicated CT of his adrenal gland. And when that was obtained, what we found was a benign adenoma. In other words, Bill had nothing wrong with him. Bill was perfectly fine apart from this hernia that needed to be repaired. And I want to draw attention to the fact that none of this was malpractice, None of this was necessarily bad care. In fact, this may well have been the standard of care. But this was a problem. This was a problem for Bill, and this felt like a problem to Tanner and I. Stories like this, this story and stories like this, just made us feel like something was missing, that something was wrong, and we needed to do something about it. And we weren't quite sure what exactly that was until uh, an important moment when Tanner 
was able to get away and attend uh, the Avoiding Avoidable Care Conference in 2012. And that was the first conference of the Lowen Institute. And when Tanner returned from that conference, he was really ecstatic and talked about how there were so many other people who were thinking the same way that we were, feeling like something needed to change but not quite sure what to do. He told me about Bernard Lowen, 90 plus years old at the time, holding forth about the social responsibility of physicians. And talking about this important pearl, the idea of doing as much as possible for the patient and as little as possible to the patient. And this really has been our rallying cry since day one for the Do No Harm Project. What we realized is that this was really an urgent ethical issue that needed to be in medical curricula immediately. So what we did was we dove into the literature to get ourselves educated on this on these issues and we gained a better understanding of what is overuse exactly and why does it matter. And so I'll just walk you through a couple important definitions to be sure we're all on the same page. And so over testing of course and this is where the benefit of the test is outweighed by its risks. And so one common example would be preoperative testing before cataract surgery. And if you guys have been paying attention, the New England Journal of Medicine just published a study that suggests despite this, this testing process, preoperative testing before cataract surgery, um, though it is not necessary, the evidence is very clear on that, probably half of Medicare beneficiaries are having this done before they have their cataract surgery. The problem with, with over-testing is the natural consequence of over-diagnosis, that you diagnose a condition potentially that though it looks like disease, it sounds like a disease, was nevertheless going to, was never going to manifest clinically for the patient, was never going to cause them trouble. And I don't want to pick on one disease in particular, but just to show you a common example, screen-detected prostate cancer, PSA-detected prostate cancer is often over-diagnosed. Natural consequence of overdiagnosis, of course, is treatment, overtreatment, where we treat a condition uh, that was nevertheless uh, not going to cause trouble for the patient. And the only way, of course, that this could um, lead to any meaningful outcome for the patient is harm, unfortunately. If it was never going to cause the patient trouble, treatment can only cause harm. And so an example of this might be treatment of PSA-detected prostate cancer or the treatment of mild hyperglycemia in an older person, treatment of mildly elevated blood pressure. Um, there are a number of examples. The one thing that was a bit more subtle and something that we hadn't been as familiar with was the issue of preference misdiagnosis. And as clinicians, we're often taught to think about making the diagnosis, get the right treatment. And that's true most of the time, but sometimes at the expense of not getting the right preference diagnosis from the patient. What are their values? What are their goals? What do they want to do? And an example of a preference misdiagnosis might be patient regret. An a result of a bisphosphonate for several years that was prescribed for uh, minimally abnormal bone mineral density, say for osteopenia. So we also started to hone our message. And what we realized was that it's not about the money. It's, we weren't interested in this because overuse is expensive. And it, certainly it is, but we didn't think that that was the most compelling reason. We didn't think that talking about the financial expense of this would necessarily motivate or resonate with clinicians to the degree that we wanted to. And so the two things we came up with was that harm is the only possible outcome here. Harm is the only possible outcome for medical overuse. And we as clinicians have an ethical obligation to do our best to avoid unnecessary harm. And so what we ended up doing, as Tanner alluded to, was in 2012 starting the Do No Harm Project. Thinking big, starting small, starting locally. And we started it because we felt like overuse was all around us, and we were starting to see it, but we weren't sure that our colleagues were seeing it. Certainly not as frequently as we thought that they potentially could. And I'll give you an example. Uh, imagine a situation. You are the new intern on the hospital service, and you're asked by your resident to discharge a patient who had been hospitalized for a couple of weeks um, for complications from urosepsis. It would be very easy to miss the fact that the urosepsis was caused by a pros prostate biopsy. It'd be even easier to miss the fact that that prostate biopsy was done for a PSA of 4. It'd be even easier to miss the fact that that PSA was done, even though the patient didn't have a good understanding that there could be some serious downsides and that the upside for him could be minimal. Our goals were simple. They were humble. We simply wanted to improve the recognition of harms from overuse at our institution. We hoped that that would just start changing the conversation, 
and hopefully the difference in conversation could lead to a difference in action. And hopefully these differences in action could lead to a change in local culture and ultimately better care for our patients. So second, uh, we had to figure out exactly what our niche was going to be. We wanted to raise awareness, we wanted to change culture, but how in the world were we going to do this? Well, we settled on clinical room nets, and there's a number of reasons for this. First and foremost, stories are powerful. Patient stories are really powerful. They're very memorable. And the process of writing a clinical vignette, it's doable. This is something that clinicians can do. Trainees can do this. It's not a huge um, ask to write a vignette in a way that designing a research study, for example, might be. This is a very familiar exercise. We've been writing up vignettes as long as medicine has been around. And so this was something that we felt like our trainees would be willing to do. We were very clear, though, that we really didn't want them to be writing about malpractice or errors necessarily. We wanted them to write about what we call reasonable overuse, things that might be very common, might be the standard of care, but nevertheless are either unneeded or unwanted by a fully informed patient. And so what our ask was, was to think in these terms. Think about doing as much as possible for the patient and as little as possible to the patient. If you see a harm in the hospital or in clinic or a harm that was nearly avoided, we want you to think these two things. Was the intervention that led to that harm or nearly led to that harm unneeded? Was it unwanted? And how can we do better going forward? Those are the stories that we want to hear about. And so here's an example from one of our trainees um, in the study we just completed. Um, they said, I think the clinical vignette's perfect because you actually have a patient that you've seen. I think other ways you're just too removed from it. It's always good to be case-based, so that sticks in your mind more, and I think you learn more from it ultimately. We felt good about this approach. We realized that others, they were already on to something. This wasn't a novel concept. We were aware of the, the concept of adverse anecdote, this idea that memories of difficult or traumatic experiences can really shape behavior far into the future. Rita Sharon and her group, her colleagues at Columbia, have written extensively about how memories of these experiences, writing about them and reflecting about them, can actually have very important consequences in terms of empathy, satisfaction with career. They can be therapeutic, both physically and emotionally. Really amazing data, simply around writing and reflection. This hasn't been lost on some of our popular journals, on being a doctor in Annals of Internal Medicine, a piece of my mind in JAMA, the Narrative Medicine Collection in JAMA Internal Medicine, and so here's another example of a quote from one of our trainees. It was just nice to put something on paper and sort of officially file my grievance in a way. The third step, as I talked about before, was when you're starting a new program, you've really got to make it stick, and it's got to stick early, otherwise it could fail. And being fresh out of residency, Tanner and I were very fortunate to have a good sense of who the supportive faculty would be and what the right rotation might be to house this uh, this curriculum. It had to be one that wasn't too busy. We didn't want people to feel too stressed out like they couldn't commit to anything extra. And so that turned out to be an outpatient rotation at the Denver VA. We wanted a writing day. We wanted to show our trainees that we mean business, that this is serious, this is something we value, that we would give them a day free of clinical duties to spend at home or spend in the library researching uh, the science around the patient they're writing up and to write a very high quality vignette. We asked the university for a website and uh, it had to be free because we didn't have any funds available where we could post these vignettes and post resources for trainees to review when they're thinking about writing the vignette. We got the chief medical resident involved, and we've uh, utilized them as facilitators. Um, certainly, they're, they know the schedules best. They're able to help arrange the writing days for the trainees to write their vignettes. They've been educators in this, teaching on a monthly basis about the key concepts of medical overuse and the key elements of the Do No Harm Project and how to participate. We wanted a competition just to create a buzz around this. And so what we did was get local ACP judges, the American College of Physicians from the Colorado chapter. They're our judges. On a quarterly basis, we send them the vignettes that have been submitted and ask them to pick the best one. And the winner gets a, a modest uh, $50 gift card, I believe, from Am Amazon. We asked our chairman of medicine to write a letter of appre appreciation to each of the participants, as well as the governor from the Colorado chapter of the American College of Physicians. They've been enthusiastic doing so. 
Our program director in internal medicine has also been very supportive, and they announce the winners um, on a quarterly basis at the house staff conferences that are had. Finally, an, uh, a hook that we wanted to tell people about was, hey, this is, this is scientific, this is scholarly, and you can get this published. So I just want to uh, let you have a look at a, a snapshot of our website. Hopefully some of you have been there, and if you haven't, you might check it out. There's not a ton there, but there's some really useful resources that I think that you'll find appealing. And so we have some basic background there in the center of the screen, and I'll direct your attention to the left side of the screen where we have required reading, which really isn't required, but in Tanner and I's view, we think it is required. So we, we ask people to go have a look there. This is where just really the heaviest hitting articles on all things overuse are housed. And then some uh, maybe less important but uh, worthy of reading articles just below it. We have all the resident vignettes that have been written at the University of Colorado. We have resident vignettes from both internal medicine, emergency medicine. We have student vignettes. We have all the published examples, the vignettes that came out of Colorado but were uh, later published in um, uh, medical journals. Those are all there. We have uh, some tips and tricks on how to identify medical overuse, how to participate in the Do No Harm Project, and some other resources that are really nice for trainees to have when they're starting to think about this. And so the stories have been piling up, just piling up over time. We've had about 65 stories told to date in the past two and a half years, and they're very powerful. They're very sticky, and people are quite enthusiastic about this. Fourth, don't underestimate your potential, because somebody out there might think your idea is a good one. And so when Tanner and I were trying to grow this project locally, we were wondering, how could we improve our credibility? How could we improve even greater awareness around the issue of medical overuse? And so we met with Patty Gabot, who's a really neat lady, a real firebrand. And she was the former CEO of Denver Health Medical Center, which is a safety net hospital here in Denver, Colorado. And she said, look, guys, if, if you want to uh, improve your, your reach here, if you want to improve your credibility, you need to find a place to publish these vignettes so people can read them on a national level. And she said, why don't you call Rita Redberg at JAMA Internal Medicine? They've already got the Less is More series there. It's been very successful. Why don't you ask her about starting a trainee Less is More series? And we thought that was a great idea. And so we called Rita Redberg, and so it was. Um, we launched the Teachable Moments series in JAMA Internal Medicine. This is a Less is More series for trainees of any stripe, really meant to publish Do No Harm style vignettes from around the country and around the world, which we've been doing since January 14. You might see some, uh, some familiar names there in the editorial that we wrote launching this series. We've teamed up with Chris Moriades at UCSF and Neil Shaw, who's at Harvard, and Deb Grady, who's one of the deputy editors of JAMA Internal Medicine. It's really been a, a good success and a lot of fun. So what I want to do is walk you through just the basic format of the Do No Harm Project and how you might structure something similar in your own institution. And so the first step here is really just to improve awareness so that the trainees know that they've got this opportunity that's coming. So I've got a master list of uh, which residents are going to which rotation, and all the residents who are headed to this particular outpatient rotation at the Denver VA where the Do No Harm Project lives, they get an email. And I just say, hey, look, um, you're going to be at the Denver VA. Um, there's a nice opportunity for you to participate in the Do No Harm Project. Here are the basic elements, just so that they know what's coming. Then I invite them to reflect on a case of harm and I, of, from medical overuse, and I provide some, some very basic, common examples so that they know what we're talking about, that we're talking about reasonable overuse. We're not talking about obvious malpractice or errors necessarily. Then when they get onto the rotation, there's an in-person pitch that we're calling it on all things medical overuse. It's about a 15-minute presentation. Tanner and I used to give this. Now the chief medical resident does it, and they really do a great job of it. Interested house staff who want to participate are asked to send a, a so-called one-liner, a basic case description. They send that to Tanner or myself within the first week of the rotation. And if we think that it has merit, that it nicely demonstrates harm or near harm from reasonable medical overuse, we route that to the chief medical resident who then schedules them a writing day. Also in the email, when we... Um, uh, reply back to the uh, to the resident or the medical student. We provide them with some references that might be relevant to the topic they're going to write on. So they have a place to go so they can really hit the ground running. 
We then state very clearly that the first draft of their vignette is due by the end of their writing day to be sure that they're taking advantage of this writing day in the way that it's meant to be. Final revisions to the case are due within 30 days, and then that final draft is posted online to our website. The participant is entered into the competition, and then um, they are encouraged to submit their vignette for publication in the Teachable Moments series. So let me give you an example. This is a one-liner from Meredith Neese. She was a second-year resident in internal medicine at the time. And I want you to remember Bill, the 55-year-old cattle rancher that I told you about at the beginning of our talk today. She says, hey, I have a potential case. I saw a patient today in clinic. It was a preoperative evaluation for a hernia repair. He had a chest x-ray ordered. He's got a history of mild asthma and remote smoking, and a 7 millimeter nodule was seen prompting a CT scan. The CT scan of the chest looks okay, but there's an incidental adrenal nodule that was found. Hard to know what's going to come of this. Maybe it will lead to something else. What do you think? And we enthusiastically replied, absolutely, this is exactly what we're talking about. Bill got probably the standard of care, but we had a problem with that. And the problem was that six months passed before Bill had his hernia repaired while we were chasing all these other things that were completely incidental findings in a man who otherwise felt well. And so it's interesting and timely that Meredith's case was the first case published in Teachable Moments in the January uh, 2014 issue of, of JAMA Internal Medicine. And we see here a resident, and we see a senior author was a faculty member. So these vignettes are a really nice way to get fellows involved, to get faculty involved, because, hey, at the end of the day, most people, particularly in academia, are interested in getting a publication. So it's a nice way to get other people involved in this process. So what are some of the barriers that we've encountered? And thankfully, there haven't been a lot, but some of the ones we've encountered have been important and worth discussing. First and foremost is that recognizing overuse is hard. Uh, recognizing errors, recognizing misuse or malpractice, that's not very difficult. But recognizing reasonable overuse is actually quite difficult. And so if you launch a program like this, it's really important that there's a strong champion that has a good sense of the nuances, the differences between overuse and really true errors or malpractice. The other thing is that time commitment is an issue. We're all busy. We're all stretched very thin. Um, but we have to convey the importance of this program to our trainees that thinking carefully about our patients and reflecting on the care that they receive actually has important meaning for both the trainee as well as the patient. And then when we were running these ideas past some of our more senior faculty, initially they said, you're going to do what exactly? You're going to publish harms from medical overuse, that seems like a problem, airing our dirty laundry potentially. And we didn't see it that way at all. We didn't see it that way at all. As passionate champions in the trenches, we were very clearly conveying the difference to them, that overuse is different. And this is something that's flying under the radar, and it's easy to miss, and it's not malpractice necessarily, and we need to be talking about it. So the right venue and the right message can be critically important. Here's another quote from one of our participants in the study. You need to approach patients by thinking about how you treat them better next time. And this is a good way to do that on paper, to really sit down and think about what went wrong or what could have changed and how you do things better. Some of the barriers that we thought about turned out to be more perceived than real. Turns out the administration were actually quite excited. They thought this was great. Having a dozen articles published in a major national journal um, over the past two years by House has been an ex has been an ex They've really been happy to think more deeply about the care that they provide to be sure that they're getting the right care to the patient at the right time. We've had to ask for consent to, uh, from some of these patients, and patients have not been angry. They've not been judgmental. They've not been upset. They've actually been very happy to provide consent, feeling as though they were participating in this process so that we can do better going forward. And then to come back to the issue of the distinction between overuse and malpractice. We're not publishing malpractice cases. We're not publishing obvious errors. We're talking about the stuff that seems so intractable. It's so common. Maybe it's a standard of care, like preoperative testing before cataract surgery. That's the stuff we want to talk about.
And so these barriers have really been turning into discussions. Before we were hearing things like, oh, you know, this isn't our problem. This is the, the emergency room. Or this is the hospital down the road. Or this is really the patient or, or somebody else. It's not me. And what we're finding out now is people are being a little more introspective and willing to admit, you know, it, it is me, and it's us, and it's all of us, and it's the system, and it's very deep, and it's very complicated. But we can do better. And asking things like, not just what is the diagnosis, but what, are we making the right preference diagnosis? What does the patient want to do? What are their goals? What are their preference? What do they value in their life? And then asking the harder questions about what exactly is the evidence? What is the evidence for pre-op testing before cataract surgery? What is the evidence for treating mild hyperglycemia, early onset diabetes, or pre-diabetes? What is the evidence for treating subclinical hypothyroidism in pregnancy? And then this is even leading into other interesting things. Overuse quality measures, which at, at one of our training sites now, we have an overuse quality measure looking at pap smear overuse. And so very exciting things, I think, coming from the changing discussion and the changing culture here at the University of Colorado. And so in summary, two and a half years later, coming up on three years actually, bottom line is that this is doable. It just takes a committed champion. Residents really get it. The students really get it. The faculty are getting it. And the conversation is changing. We've had 65 high-quality vignettes to date, four posters at national conferences, a dozen of these cases from CU published in Teachable Moments. It's very exciting. We're seeing adoption elsewhere. This opportunity to change culture and get published, it's a very enticing combination. And we're seeing programs um, bubbling up at other, pr at other places, UCSF, um, University of Oregon, University of Alabama, Vanderbilt, um, even getting out of internal medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, they're starting a program in MedPeds. Washington University is starting a program where they actually have a program in emergency medicine. University of South Carolina and their OBGYN program is really exciting. Recently, the first national competition was completed, and you're going to be hearing from one of the winners in just a moment. And finally, the qual qualitative study of the impact of this program has recently been completed, and that is currently being submitted for publication. And so, just again, Measure the impact. If you're going to take the time, measure the impact to prove that it's doing something important. And so this program continues to grow, going in new directions. We're seeing students writing more vignettes. This was, originally was targeted to internal medicine residents only, but the students are getting in on the action. We're seeing emergency medicine physicians writing vignettes. The Do No Harm Project has been built into our longitudinal integrated clerkship at Denver Health this year. We had a $5,000 donation from a senior faculty member, which given the cost of our program is going to make this sustainable at least for the next 15 years or so, and so that's wonderful. Other directions, uh, here in my own clinic at the University of Colorado, in our resident continuity clinic, we've replaced traditional peer teaching with a narrative medicine exercise, looking at the possible harms from medical overuse. We were fortunate to be able to host the first regional conference of the Lown Institute on medical overuse, the so-called Right Care Alliance conference, which was here last fall. We've even adapted these cases to a, a, a morbidity and mortality conference format in our divisional grand rounds called Right Care Rounds, which is another program of the Lown Institute that uh, you'll be hearing more about in a subsequent webinar. And so none of this could be happening if it was just Tanner and I. There's just no way. This is happening because there's so many other people who are, who are involved. So community is really a big deal. Another quote. Going through the exercise and being introduced to these other people, I think really allowed myself for those feelings and interests to grow, and I may not have otherwise thought much of it. That's very powerful. And so just to advertise some of the successes, I don't want to belabor this. We were very fortunate to be one of the first winners of the Teaching Value and Choosing Wisely competition in 2013, and we also won an award from the uh, National American College of Physicians for our Colorado chapter, so-called Evergreen Award, for our novel approach to medical education. So advertise your successes. So just to revisit the lessons learned, I hope you'll take some of these back to your home institution. Think big, but start small. Um, you don't have to conquer this overnight. Find your niche. Be thoughtful about that. Maximize your chances of success. And make it sticky. Get people excited. Let them know that there's a whole lot more at stake here than the, than the financial downsides of medical overuse. That really what's hanging in the balance is the quality care of our patients. And don't, don't underestimate your potential. It may not seem like a great idea, but maybe it is. 
and let others talk to you about that. Um, people can really um, can really be influential and move things along in a very positive direction. If you're going to do this hard work, measure the impact. Enough said there. And community is a big deal. Don't try to do this alone. And if you have some successes along the way, be sure to advertise them. But hey, don't uh, don't just take our word for it. What I want to do is is let you hear it from Stephanie Chin. She's a second year internal medicine resident at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. And as Dr. Sani uh, mentioned early in the webcast, that she was one of our winners in the uh, Do No Harm Project National Vignette Competition. And she shared her vignette at the recent uh, national meeting of the Lown Conference in San Diego. So with that, I will let Stephanie take it away. My name is Stephanie Chen. I'm a second year resident in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins Bayview Hospital and I'm really excited to be a part of the Lone Institute Do No Harm Project and to share my vignette with everyone. So this is a story about an 82 year old loving father of two who has a history of chronic atrial fibrillation and delirium. He was admitted to the hospital for a mechanical fall resulting in a hip fracture and then he was placed on a telemetry monitor um, for this chronic atrial fibrillation. Um, so you may wonder, what's the harm of some wires and a telemetry monitor? Um, but let me tell you the rest of the story. So this patient became very confused and delirious overnight. He yanked off his monitor, um, resulting in a flurry of alarms. The nurses all ran in and put the monitor back in place. Um, but this just kept happening all night and kept the nurses really busy. Eventually, um, the provider gave the patient a shot of intramuscular Ativan and put him in soft restraints just to keep this telemetry monitor in place. And then they had to call in a sitter to watch this patient very closely. Um, now this may not be a very new story, but I think it definitely highlights um, whether or not all this effort um, and interventions like the Ativan and wrist restraints, which potentially cause worsening delirium, was really warranted in someone with chronic atrial fibrillation. And so I want to share the story because telemetry often has unintended consequences that we don't always think about. Um, for the patient, this case definitely highlights delirium and um, uh, and patients often really just don't like being on the monitor. It, they can't shower, it's really uncomfortable. And there's a published case series that show patients getting unnecessary workup from artifacts found on telemetry monitoring. Um, this case also highlights from a systems perspective the unintended consequences of telemetry. Um, not only is there a cost aspect to telemetry, but telemetry is very resource intensive. In this case, the nurses were busy all night keeping a monitor in place that wasn't needed. In other studies, they've found that nurses spend probably around 20 minutes a day per patient just maintaining telemetry, and that's answering alarms, putting the wires back in place, changing the batteries. Um, very busy for the nurses. And of course, false alarms is another big issue. At our institution, we found an alarm going off every four minutes, and a lot of them weren't necessarily clinically significant. Um, and then from a hospital perspective, um, hospital throughput is really affected since patients may end up waiting for hours in the emergency department, waiting for a telemetry bed. And so um, this Do No Harm project is really helpful to help us see the um, systemic effects of telemetry and spur some initiatives that we've taken at our own hospital. Um, we've provided a lot of resident-driven um, educational initiatives to use telemetry more appropriately, and we're working on putting um, systems effects into place so people can use telemetry more appropriately. And even though we've had a lot of data in our hospital about telemetry use, I think this clinical vignette was very powerful when we share um, stories about telemetry overuse. Um, we are also a part of a group called PhysiciansForResponsibleOrdering.org. Um, you can check out our website with other resources that we've developed for telemetry if you're interested in starting your own project. So um, that's it. Thanks for letting me share my vignette and for letting me be a part of this great initiative. Okay. 
All right. Thank you to all of our presenters, Brandon Combs, Tanner Caberly, and Stephanie Chen. We will now open up the floor to questions. I believe we received some questions um, over the presentation, so we will start with those. And if you have any more, please continue to type them into the Q&A section so we can um, get to all of them. Great. So uh, if everyone can hear me, it's Joe Colucci at the Lone Institute. Um, and uh, Casey Quinlan sent in our first question right at the beginning, which is a great one. How can patients help? Hi, this is Brandon Combs. And um, the, the question is, how can patients help? That's a really great question. And I think there's a number of ways they could potentially help with this. First. To, to have a conversation with their friends, have a conversation with their family. Talk about these things. What happened? Were you harmed from medical overuse? What exactly happened? Um, talk to people in your community. Share these stories at your churches. One of the key things here is to raise awareness around this so that patients can really engage their physicians in these conversations, saying things like, somebody at my church was harmed from a, a screening PSA test. Um, why am I still getting a PSA test every year? Can we talk about that? Can we talk about the pros? Can we talk about the cons? And is this test right for me? So that might be one approach that patients could use uh, to help start really advocating for themselves and engaging in conversations with their physicians. So our next question comes from Shannon Brownlee. She says, uh, we know that the Do No Harm vignettes aren't supposed to be about major malpractice or serious errors. But why is it that what you've termed uh, routine overuse isn't considered an error? You know, I think that um, it certainly could be, and maybe we're splitting hairs here. But we think that there is an important distinction between things that are just obviously wrong and are sort of never events versus those that are so entrenched and so ingrained in common medical practice that at face value seem worthwhile that seem intuitively worthwhile, early disease detection, treating disease earlier rather than later. And so these things, um, just to us, don't feel like an error the way that giving penicillin to somebody with a penicillin allergy feels like an error, or the way that wrong-sided surgery feels like an error. And so I think that there is a subtle but important difference there. And if we want to call attention to these things, and if we want to be able to get traction in a, a fairly conservative medical environment, I think that's what we live in, then I think it makes most sense to acknowledge um, some of these more subtle things, some of these things that we're all doing um, to, to really start making a difference. Our next question the University of Colorado has a strong medical humanities program. Have you worked with them at all? Absolutely. And so um, in the, we have engaged with, with the, that group here at the University of Colorado, and in particular with the narrative medicine exercise that we're doing at, uh, at one of our continuity clinic sites. And uh, they've, ab they've absolutely been very, uh, very useful and um, have provided a lot of assistance along the way. So we are in touch with them for sure. Our next question uh, is about preference misdiagnosis. The audio seems to have cut out a little bit when you were talking about it earlier. Can you elaborate some on what people have learned about preference misdiagnosis, maybe referencing some cases that have been presented at the University of Colorado? So uh, one example of a preference misdiagnosis. And so the, the example that I shared early on um, around a patient who had what's called an atypical femoral fracture. And so this is a, a fracture of the femur that typically doesn't uh, occur in the typical way that a traumatic fracture might occur, say an older person with osteoporosis who falls and breaks their hip in the typical location. An atypical femoral fracture is one that happens further down the shaft of the femur and is often seen in the context of bisphosphonate therapy. Now that's not a reason not to use bisphosphonates, and that's not at all to say that bisphosphonates aren't useful. Certainly in the right patients, they can reduce the risk of hip fracture, which is an important thing to prevent. But if applied to the wrong patient, then what you're left with is only trouble for the patient. And so the patient that I'm thinking of was um, a very healthy person. Uh, she was a middle-aged woman who had very mild osteopenia, and she was given a well-intended treatment 
bisphosphonate to improve her bone mineral density to diminish her chance of having a fracture. But it turns out in that population, the chance of benefiting in terms of reducing fracture risk, it's very small. It approaches zero. And so what you're left with in that instance is just the downside of the medication, which for many medications isn't a huge downside. Oftentimes it's something as simple as remembering to take the medication or being able to afford the medication or the medication interacting with other medication. But some medications have real downsides and an unfortunate but real downside of bisphosphonate therapy is the relatively infrequent um, but very serious complication of atypical femoral fracture. Thankfully this is uncommon after five years of therapy the risk of it is on the order of one in a couple thousand but if you're that one person that matters. And so after she learned that her fracture was probably from the bisphosphonate she had a very deep sense of regret that she didn't know she didn't know that this medication could have that harm. And she didn't know that her chance of benefiting from that intervention was quite low. And so that's an, a, an example of harm from a preference misdiagnosis. All right. I believe that's correct. Those are the questions that we have received. Um, we are coming um, upon 2 p.m. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. We apologize for the technical difficulties. Hopefully next time we'll be able to air those out before. Um, and like Brandon alluded to earlier in his presentation, we hope to have a Right Care Rounds webinar in the upcoming months. So please look out for that. And so thank you to all of our presenters. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us at info at and we'll be able to answer your questions there. So thanks once again, and we hope you enjoyed the Do No Harm Project webinar.